So we are going to quickly go over the code that we did last time. This way we understand Metropolis algorithm um, because last time we did it as a code, live coding. This time I'll just explain what the code does so that you have a better understanding of what's happening in the code. Um, so we had the target distribution, which is a we defined it as 24813. That's just the density mm -hmm. of or the peaks or the heights of the target distribution. As we discussed in theory, it doesn't have to be um, a probability distribution. So since we have five different values, we have five states, theta one through five. The most frequent state is theta equals three. The least frequent state would be theta equals four. The number of iterations I chose for the chain is 10,000. Theta dot P is the proposed theta at each iteration. Now, I have to initialize the proposed theta because later I am going to build a vector. Or I cannot build a vector unless you initialize the vector. So, which is why I initialized it by giving the value zero. So, theta dot p, the first element will be zero, which will get replaced later on. Um, Theta dot C is a random state that I picked. I am assuming that the current state is at two. Could I have picked another state after it? I could have picked four, I could have picked five. We will toy with that later at the end. We didn't do that last time. So I'm using a loop to run through all iterations. So at each iteration, I'm going to come up with a proposed state. And I'm either going to accept that state or not. If I accept it, I will make it the state at time step, for instance, two. Time step two would mean I equals two. I'll go to the next iteration, I equals three. I'll propose the state. If I accept it according to the algorithm, I will pretend. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, <coughs> move to the next step. So the proposed state, initially, I'm using sample, which is from one to five, comma one. It is a built-in function where it chooses one outcome from the sequence one through five. With one through five here, create a sequence, and I'm picking one at random. However, the sample function does it using a uniform distribution, which is why when we do p to dot p, when we did the histogram of p to dot p last time, we had a uniform histogram. I'll do that today. I don't believe uh, we included the histogram of the proposal distribution. Um, that is our standard condition. Once I propose a theta for the current iteration, I'm going to go to the current iteration, which is theta dot p of one. Even though I initialized it to zero, when I come in here, it's no longer zero. It is going to be some number from the sequence one to five. So that index p to dot p of i will pick one of these five values. For instance, if p to dot p of one happens to be two, then it will pick p of two, which is four. Likewise, over here, if the current state, which in this case is in fact two, so I'll have two 
and it'll pick four of the K. Now, P of two divided by P of two is one. Yes. So you are definitely moving. But when you move to the proposed state, you are actually staying at two. Does that make sense? Um, in that specific case. So when the move probability is one, I'm accepting the proposed state, saving it to the next current state. In other words, time step two. Good. If move is not one, I'm generating a random uniform number. Like we did in our lecture, we're going to move according to the U that we generate. If U is less than the move probability, then I accept the proposal. Otherwise, I'm going to stay at the current state. Does that make sense? So the next state that I'm, the next time step, whatever state that I'm going to be in, which is p to dot c of i plus one will be the same as I am at this iteration if u is greater than or equal to p dot two. Does that make sense? The move probability. That is our algorithm where we will definitely move if p dot move is one. Yes, if the move probability is one. But if it is not one, then we're going to move using a uniform number that we generate. We set a threshold and we move according to that threshold. In the sense, either we accept that proposal or we don't accept that proposal. If we don't accept the proposal, the next time step, whatever state that you have, is that you are staying where you start. So we go through this. 10,000 times, 10,000 iterations, the walk that we did, oops, what happened? I didn't run the code. The walk that we had is that, so we started at state two, yes. Turns out we stayed at state two. Yes. Then we move on to state three, four, stay at four, back to three, one to five, back to two. So I'm going to keep on going back and forth, back and forth. If I change the time steps into the one through ten, I put it as one through hundred. Those are all the time steps that, that we have. It looks like a messy picture. It looks messy because we're making jumps that are not continuous. They are discrete jumps. We're going from state to state in discrete manner, uh, which is why it looks weird. But when we use continuous states, it looks nice. I yes, was, I was going to ask does this model break the rules of our, our setup? No, because here you can move. To any state from any state, whereas previously we said you can only move one to the left and one to the right. Well, to make it easier, the proof that we did to make it easier, we went with that approach. Oh, okay. Yeah, but, but just for the proof, just yes, for the, for the purposes of that proof, we considered that. But in reality, theta could be continuous. But okay. for me to explain that using a continuous theta, okay. I didn't want to. Which is why we simplify that proof. Um, proof is an easy invention. And that's yet another reason as to why we didn't use that 0.5 there, because that 0.5 was limited to that one proof um, that we did, or whatever verification that we wanted to do. So if I retain that 0.5, I should redefine my uniform variable here. For it to work properly. Um, so once that is done, 
data histogram. That is my histogram. And you can see that matches the distribution that we had our target distribution back the steps right there. That is the target corresponding histogram. In R, when you save histogram to a variable, it saves as an S3 object. So an S3 object has a bunch of has a bunch of elements in it and you can access each element inside the object using a dollar sign so i can list all objects that are in h or excuse me all elements in the object h which is a histogram object and it tells me that there is an element named bricks one named counts one main density, equidist, one main mint, and main. I believe there is X name. Um, that's it. You know what I said for you? List. List. List elements of list names of the object. Do you know what it abbreviates? Like why is it LS? List. List. Stats. Subject. LIST and LS. And it goes back oh, to oh okay yeah yeah it goes it back to a unit system and okay. unit systems Linux is LS same with that too yeah, yeah. I LS. thought this was special but okay yeah that's just an assumption um to access counts because I wanted to know what these counts were I'm using H dollar counts and those will give me the five counts that we created, but the way the default histogram works, it will automatically insert those zeros. So what I wanted to do is get rid of those zeros and keep only the corresponding counts. To do that, I did this step. Um, I'm going to break it down into two steps so you can understand it better. So, I'm going to define a new variable called ID H. Uh, how about this? I'll do it as ID.nz stands for non-zero IDs, non-zero indices. So when I run this, the histogram object that was created had, I believe, 20 elements. 20. So This statement h dollar counts will take the vector that we have and it is going to test vector not equal to zero. Pick out the indices that are not equal to zero. So technically speaking, I should get true there, true there, true, true, and true. That's the logical vector. First element, true. Fifth element, true. Tenth element, true. Fifteen, true. Last one, true. Does that make sense? Now, since this is logical, when I go back and create a new vector from the old one by typing the non zero logical vector, it will only return values for which I had true. So 1, 5, 10, 15, and 20 were the only indices that had non zero values. So if 
I picked out the non zero values. The next step is to divide the non zero values by the total number of iterations, which is n. That will give me p dot f. Mind you, this is a probability distribution. What we started with was not a probability distribution. So if I want to compare this to what I started with, I have to normalize the original target distribution, which wasn't a probability distribution, to make it a probability distribution. So normalizing the original target distribution so that it becomes a probability distribution. Good guess. Um, so that would be P. P divided by sum of P will simply normalize and the new p that I have is a probability density function. So that, oops, that is p. I want to compare the two, the estimated p and the actual p that we had. So I have five states, one through five. The estimated uh, probabilities using the chain. And the actual probabilities from the original target distribution. Uh, from those, you can see that our target distribution and the estimated distribution are the same. Of course, they shouldn't be connected by lines because these are discrete states, but for the sake of you know, points, um, to see things better, did it that way, but I would change it to points, um, set the size of the point to two, use color red, then blue, and change lines to points, so I do points, simply points. Um, actually, let's repeat that back. So, we'll go circle it. So, so, that is the picture you get. So, the two circles combined together. Um, I could make this even better if I changed one of the markings. Uh, perhaps made that one bigger or smaller, let's make it smaller, 0.5, and change the character to a filled dot, I believe that is 19. There it is. <coughs> Good. It seemed to match up pretty well. Are we good? 